Do we know how many registrants have? Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College, and it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here for this second Janet Rossent lecture in celebration of the accomplishments of Dr. Sonia Anand. So I'm so delighted to welcome you here at Massey College, this beautiful building which was built on indigenous land, lands that had been occupied by indigenous communities for centuries, the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge their stewardship of the land and are very grateful for the opportunity that we have here to congregate for this uh, Massey Grand Rounds and also virtually to be there with you. So welcome to this uh, event. It's wonderful to be able to continue our work in this format of doing it both accessible to everyone through uh, the magic of technology and also being here at Massey College. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Albie Angel, who is a senior fellow at Massey College, but also the mentor and advisor to the Massey Grand Rounds, which is the program at Massey that deals with health sciences. Albie. Thank you very much. Natalie, I think I'll just sit for my comments, if I may. If we get the slides up in slide mode. Thank you so much for the introductions. It's wonderful that you can do that and be here with us to launch the 2020 Massey Grand Rounds. Good morning and welcome to the virtual presentation of the 2020 Massey Grand Rounds Symposium and the second annual Janet Rosant Lecture. My role as founding mentor of MGR is to provide some background perspective of the MGR Symposium and to introduce a key feature, the Janet Rosant Lecture. Massey Grand Rounds was founded in 2006 to nourish members of the Massey College community with insights from medical and scientific leaders. Massey Grand Rounds convenes monthly during the academic term and serves as a discussion forum for topics related to medicine, the health sciences, and issues of interest to students. Each year in March, our program includes a major symposium organized by junior fellows, which was postponed this year because of COVID-19 pandemic. It is restored in today's gathering as a virtual event for your digital entertainment. The theme of this year's program, slide please, is shown in the poster, Gender and Ethnic Variations in Health Risks. Slide please. The featured presentation includes the 2020 Janet Rosant Lecture by Dr. Sonia Anand and complimentary talks by Dr. Gillian Hawker and Dr. Sheldon Tobe. Thank you, colleagues, for participating. Next slide, please. Well, we are in our 14th year of Massey Grand Rounds. I make a point of paying tribute to our founding MGR leaders, Fiona Menzies, Martin Betts, Jay Shaw, Janice Wong, John Neary, Lori Waters, Andrew House and John Dirks. This photo was taken at our first MGR dinner gathering in the private dining room at Massey. All these colleagues are now practicing leader and leadership positions uh, in the country. Slide four, please. Our program has evolved over the past years and is now significantly enhanced with a named lectureship that honors two extraordinary accomplished leading edge Canadian scientists. Dr. Janet Rosant, Senior Fellow and President and Scientific Director, Canada Gairdner Foundation, whose name is enshrined in this award. The lectureship was established two years ago in recognition of Dr. Rosant's distinguished career as a scientist, builder, and leader in medical research and her dedicated mentorship of young scientists. Slide, please. The purpose of the lectureship is to host promising young scientists to enliven the intellectual discourse at Massey College. Dr. Sonia Nand is the 2020 Rossant Lecturer and is being honored today 
She'll be formally introduced by Dr. Daniel Schultz in a moment. Congratulations to Dr. Drossant and Anand. Slide, please. As mentioned, Dr. Anand's lecture today is complemented by brief presentations by two physician scientist leaders. Dr. Jillian Hawker, Senior Fellow and Chair, Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto, and Dr. Sheldon Tobe, Professor of Medicine at U of T and Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Their talks expand on Dr. Anand's presentation dealing with gender and ethnic variations in health risks. The speakers will also be introduced later on by last year's MGR co-chair, Dr. Daniel Schultz. Slide, please. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the sponsors of Massey Grand Rounds, whose support over the years has assured continuing development of the program since its inception. Foremost is Massey College and our principal, Natalie DeRosier, for her enthusiastic promotion of the MGR program. I will also acknowledge her predecessors, the Honorable Hugh Siegel, who established the Janet Rosant Lectureship at college, and before him, Master John Fraser, who fostered Massey Grand Rounds. We're also grateful to Dr. Trevor Young, Dean, Faculty of Medicine at the University, and Dr. Jillian Hawker, Chair, Department of Medicine, for their long-standing endorsement and support of Massey Grand Rounds. Friends of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Diabetes Research and Treatment Center are charitable organizations based at Massey College and provide substantial in-kind administrative support for this program. Now this is an opportune time to formally present Dr. Sonia Nand with the 2020 Janet Rosant Lectureship Award. It consists of an engraved crystal tower commemorating the occasion and an honorarium to be sent to her by mail. The crystal tower is displayed uh, on the table here and will be presented in person at an appropriate time. But at the moment, I'd like to invite Dr. Janet Rassan to join me virtually in presenting this commemorative crystal tower, marking the date and title of Dr. Sonia Nan's 2020 Rossant Lecture at the 2020 Massey Grand Round Symposium. Congratulations, Sonia, on behalf of Dr. Rossant, who's with me on the podium virtually, and congratulations for this well-deserved recognition. And now we virtually present you with this charming tower, which reads, to honor Dr. Sophia Nand, Janet Rosan Lecture, Massey College, Toronto. The date is March 25th, 2020, when it was originally to be presented at Massey Grand Rounds, now uh, uh, virtually today. It has a red border representing cardiovascular sciences. It's now my pleasure to transition to Dr. Rossant, who will continue with the program with her comments and introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Orby. It's really a great honor and a pleasure to be here, if only virtually. Um, the Janet Rossant Lecture, it's, it's a very strange feeling to have a lecture named after you, I have to say, and it's a great honor to have such a lecture. When Orby suggested this concept, I really thought this would be a great opportunity to highlight younger scientists, I'm getting to the end of my career, younger scientists who have made major contributions in sort of biomedical research. There's a particular emphasis on diversity, really trying to bring to, to the, the table some of the best scientists across the country to talk about their research in Massey Grand Rounds. So Sonia Anand is a great example of the kind of people that we were looking for. I've known Sonia for some time, mostly in my role as president of the Gardner Foundation, because Sonia sits on our adjudication committees for the Gardner Awards. And her breadth of clinical and research expertise is really highly appreciated in that panel and certainly highly appreciated uh, across the country and around the world. 
So it's a great pleasure to be here in person to listen to the Janet Rossant lecture and to hear the other talks as well. And so without further ado, congratulations again to Sonia. And I'm going to hand over the emceeing task now to the leadership of the MGR. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sant, and thank you everyone, again, everyone, for coming to the 2020 virtual Janet Rosant lecture presented by the 14th annual Massey Grand Ram Symposium on Gender and Ethnic Variations in Health Risks. We are very excited to have everyone here today. My name is Daniel Schultz. I am the organizing Massey Grand Rounds co-chair from 2020, 2019 to 2020, and on my left and right are Krish Bilamoria and Anastasia Krolo, the organizing co-chairs for Massey Grand Rounds this year. I would also like to take this time to acknowledge my colleague Daniel Hidrew, uh, who could not be here today, and Arsenal Amir, both previous MGR co-chairs who have been essential in organizing this lectureship and their, for con their continued support of Massey Grand Rounds over many years. As introduced by Dr. Angel, Massey Grand Rounds is a welcoming group at Massey College mentored by senior fellow Dr. Angel with a focus on engaging the Massey community in intellectually stimulating discussions and facilitating the exchange of ideas in health science and medicine. We do this through monthly meetings, as well as our annual MGR Symposium, our premier event, where we gather distinguished guests, speakers, and panelists to discuss timely issues. This, this is Massey Gun Round's fourth year, and we have the honor and pleasure of hosting the Janet Rosant Lectureship, which is presented this year to Dr. Sanya Anand, in conjunction with our yearly symposium, which is titled Gender and Ethnic Variations in Health Risks, where we, with the help of our distinguished speakers, hope to examine and discuss the importance of understanding the interactions of gender, cultural, and socioeconomic status on health risk factors, and how they can direct potential targets for medical interventions and improve healthcare for all. To begin, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Sanya Anand, a professor of medicine and epidemiology at McMaster University and a senior scientist at the Population Health Research Institute, where she holds the Canada Research Chair in Ethnic Diversity and Cardiovascular Disease. She is also a vas vascular medicine specialist at Hel Hamilton Health Sciences and McMaster University. Through these appointments, her research focuses upon the environment, environmental and genetic determinants of vascular disease in populations of varying ancestral, ancestral origin and women. Today, we have the honor to hear her speak on understanding the influence of gender and ancestral origin on the development of cardiovascular disease, a life course perspective, where she will present an overview of how observations in white Caucasian adult men indicated a need to understand if cardiovascular disease risks were the same in women and diverse ancestral groups in Canada and globally. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to Dr. Anand. Thank you for being here. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the award and the honor of presenting today. Some of my research work, a special congratulations to Dr. Rosant for all of the pioneering work she did in stem cell research, uh, but also as a woman scientist. And uh, I learn from her each and every time we meet together as the Gardner Review Committee. So thank you to Janet. Thank you also to Dr. Abby Angel for uh, working with the team and me to make this event that we hope to have in March now uh, in virtually uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. I in fact was in New Zealand when the pandemic hit in March and uh, rushed back home and life then changed for all of us. But we have overcome many of these challenges and uh, it's great to be here today to present some of my work. So I'll just pull up my screen and we'll get started. So as a number of people mentioned, today I would like to present uh, the influence of gender and ancestral origin along with social determinants of health as they may relate to the development of cardiovascular disease across the life course. And th these are questions that I've asked over the past 20 years as part of my research program based here at McMaster. Some of you may have seen this picture before. It is quite a striking and a iconic picture of a young Pashtun girl uh, in Afghanistan 
at age 12, and then the National Geographic photographer went back and found her in Afghanistan at the age of 30. And her change in physical appearance characterizes a concept known as weathering. And the weathering hypothesis proposes that women age in different ways depending on their different life circumstances and how these circumstances may undermine or promote health. And as such, women's health reflects a culmination of advantages and possible disadvantages. And in the case of this young woman, uh, she had experienced an incredible amount of adversity between the age of 12 and 30, life in a refugee camp, the mother of three children, losing her husband at an early age. And this all has taken a toll, obviously, on her longevity and her physical appearance. We can contrast her life of challenge and many disadvantages with a princess's life, that of Princess Diana, also shown here is a 20 year difference in her age from 16 to 36. And she lived a life of privilege on the other hand and you can see that she has a very youthful look at age 36. She died tragically for other reasons, but this serves as a contrast between the trajectories that two women who grew up in completely different settings, circumstances, and wealth uh, then uh, face in terms of health and longevity. So what do we mean when we say life course perspective? What that means is really considering the impact of exposures and lifestyles from before birth. The pregnant woman's exposures impact her developing fetus and the newborn baby. And across the development now of the newborn baby, uh, we will see changes in some the development of risk factors and in others uh, no risk factors and what happens early on in life impacts what we may see in patients as adults and more and more of our research is shifting from adult onset disease to trying to understand these early influences now a few definitions I will use throughout today's presentations the terms ethnicity and sometimes ancestry. Race typically is uh, used as a term to distinguish differences in physical characteristics. In some countries, it is used more often to reflect many other uh, factors. In particular, in particular, in the United States, race is more commonly used than here in Canada where we use the term ethnicity, which is more expansive than mere biological differences. It also incorporates cultural differences that may include differences or similarities in language, religion, and way of living. And ancestry is typically used when we're descri describing genetic studies, uh, when we ask individuals, their parents and grandparents uh, origin. So I think that for today's conversation, I will be using ethnicity and ancestry. Now, if we think about cardiovascular disease, what is that? That refers to heart attacks or strokes, for example. When individuals started to look around the world, they observed that certain populations had high risks of cardiovascular disease and others had lower risks. And these studies shown here, the seven country studies, the blue zones, and migration studies of people who left one country of origin and then lived in new environments are the ones that I will review. And the questions we can ask from looking at these types of studies are, are variations in cardiovascular disease observed by countries due to ethnic differences or country differences? Are the risk factors between different populations different or are they common? 
And are the differences that we see in risk factors and disease rates due to genetic differences or differences in health behaviors or perhaps differences in both sets of factors. Now I mentioned the seven countries study. The seven countries study was pioneered by an American physiologist in the 1950s named Ansel Keys, shown here. And he went around the world and observed that certain countries had relatively low rates of heart disease and stroke and relatively uh, lower consumption of saturated fat in the diet. And you can see on the graphic shown here, he plotted these countries comparing the amount of saturated fat they consumed versus the death rate overall and the death rate from cardiovascular disease. And at the high end, he showed that countries such as the United States had a high saturated fat intake and a high death rate. Whereas on the low end, Japan had a low consumption of saturated fat and a relatively lower rate of death. And so from this, the fat and heart disease hypothesis was born. The next uh, area of study where we observe differences in cardiovascular disease rates comes from what is well known as the blue zones around the world. And blue zones refer to those regions of the globe where there is a greater proportion of individuals who live beyond 100 years of age, the centragenarians. And they're more than tenfold common in these five regions of the world compared to other regions. And you can see they're quite diverse from Loma Linda, California to Northern Japan and Okinawa. And the common features of these regions where people can live over 100 years of age are their locally produced and consumed diets, so growing their own food and raising animals, uh, regular physical activity through walking, having daily naps, not wearing watches, unlike many of us. They were not living by the time of day and the pressures that come with having a tight schedule. And they had a very strong sense of community, which speaks to strong social support networks. From migrant studies, we have learned that an individual of a common ethnic group, in this case, uh, Japanese individuals, when they live in Japan versus Honolulu, Hawaii versus California, have different patterns and distributions of cardiovascular disease. Lower heart disease living in Japan, higher heart disease in San Francisco, higher stroke rates in Japan, and lower stroke rates in San Francisco. And with the change of environment, the risk factors changed as well, such as an increased saturated fat in the diet as they move from Japan to San Francisco, but a decrease in smoking rates and differences in their stress patterns. So it's difficult for us to know, and we can think of the concept that an individual is like a seed, the environment is like the soil, and the seed can be planted in different environments and then may manifest disease in different ways. In my own research work, I was interested in understanding the South Asian diaspora. South Asian refers to people who originate from the Indian subcontinent. And what had been observed 50 years ago was that individuals who left India to other countries, be it South Africa, the United Kingdom, Australia, and North America, seemed to die earlier of heart attack compared to other people living in that country. The South Asian diaspora is large with at least 24 million people having left India and settled around the world. So this became an interest of mine and I also had a personal family interest in this question. My maternal great-grandparents originated from Northern India in Punjab, and they lived almost like a blue zone type of life. They grew and produced their own food. They walked throughout the village. They invited other people into their home often to share food, and they lived well into their 80s. Contrast this to my grandfather, 
who left his family home to search for new opportunities and migrated to East Africa and Uganda. There, he uh, began to smoke cigarettes. He had no shortage of food, and he was the first in the family to buy a car, an automobile. So his exercise level went down. All of the riches that people look to in terms of advancing their lifestyles. Unfortunately, my grandfather and his brother died prematurely of a heart attack. Exactly the question of interest for me. So we can see this marked change in lifestyle and unfortunately, an earlier onset of heart disease. So I began approximately 20 years ago now to be interested in the question of South Asians who live in Canada. And one of our summer students, now a cardiologist at McMaster Tage Safe, was able to take a list of unique surnames of South Asian ethnicity and Chinese ethnicity and merge them with the Canadian National Mortality Database. This was the first study of ethnic variations in mortality that had a very precise measurement of ethnicity. Prior to this, Statistics Canada coded people based on their reported country of origin, which for many South Asians was Africa because they came here from East Africa. So there were some inaccuracies in that approach. Tage Seth was able to show that people of South Asian origin, using their unique surname, had a higher mortality from coronary heart disease compared to people of Chinese origin and European origin. And we were also intrigued to see that the rates of cancer varied by ethnic group, whereas people of Chinese origin having higher rates compared to South Asians and white Caucasians. So this was the first uh, analysis where we did see that South Asians who came to live in Canada had a higher rate of heart disease. So we went on to recruit individuals from three Canadian cities, Toronto, Edmonton, and Hamilton, based on their ethnicity. And this was in the late 1990s as part of the SHARE study. And we recruited individuals using the surname uh, ability of coding ethnicity and observed that the prevalence of risk factors that we call metabolic syndrome, which is shown in this gentleman cartoon here, abdominal obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, were higher in people of non-white ethnic groups, in particular South Asians, in both women and men. And this demonstrated for us that risk factors may be similar, but occur at different rates in different ethnic groups. During the process of this study, one of my colleagues asked, well, what about indigenous people in Canada? I had no connections with the indigenous communities in Canada at that time, but formed these connections with people from the Six Nations community which is very close to Hamilton and represents the largest reserve in Canada. And in the Six Nations population, also using a random sampling technique, we observe much higher rates of a metabolic syndrome in men and women from the Six Nations reserve. And these higher rates of metabolic syndrome factors resulted in higher rates of cardiovascular disease in a direct correlation. So this was our first examination of ethnic variations within Canada. And this led to a next study, as research studies often do. You answer one question, and that leads to new questions. And my mentor uh, asked the question, are cardiovascular risk factors the same or different in ethnic groups? In fact, grants to study cardiovascular disease up until that time had actually said, well, we know the risk factors in white Caucasians, but maybe there's a whole set of other ones in different ethnic groups. So Salim Youssef, my supervisor at the time and my mentor and colleague, uh, created the interheart case control in which 27,000 people from 52 countries were recruited worldwide. These individuals either had a heart attack, the first one uh, they had ever had, 
versus no history of heart disease. So it was a case control match study. And what we observed in the interheart study is nine modifiable risk factors shown here accounted for 90% of the heart attacks in the population globally. And you can see that women and men all have the same risk factors. However, the frequency of the risk factor may differ. So women are less likely to smoke, and therefore, although smoking is a risk factor for heart disease in women, it is not accounting for as much of the population burden of heart attack as smoking does for men. So this is the interheart study that provides us an opportunity to look across the 52 countries, as well as different ethnic groups, as well as looking at women and men and their differences. This shows you looking across the countries recruited in the interheart study that that 90% population attributable risk of the nine risk factors is pretty consistent across all regions of the world, which helps solidify the point that risk factors for cardiovascular disease are common across regions and ethnic groups in the world. Now, if the risk factors are the same, we do note that there may be some risk factors like smoking, which are higher in men, and other risk factors such as diabetes that may be more prevalent in certain ethnic groups. And with respect to women, some of you may remember that the Framingham Heart Study had promoted that women are protected from heart disease. So there was something about women that protected them from heart disease, whereas men were at risk. So we were interested to look at this within the interheart study. And what we observed is, again, the risk factors are the same, but their relative importance depends on the frequency of that risk factor in the population. And you can see here for women and men, we have almost all the same risk factors, but the order of priority differs based on the frequency. And then I'll also demonstrate here, if we look at the age of first heart attack, the blue bars in this slide reflect men. And in fact, men do suffer their first heart attack on average 10 years earlier compared to women. So this notion of women being protected from heart disease is shown basically by the fact that men develop heart disease earlier than women. It's not that women don't develop heart disease, but not as commonly at younger ages. And then I explored this in more depth to say, what is the probability that a woman compared to a man will suffer a heart attack or myocardial infarction before the age of 60. You can see it's about half. So 60% of people who had a heart attack less than age 60 were men compared to 30% being women. When I tried to explain why it was that we observed this difference by adjusting for those nine modifiable risk factors for myocardial infarction, this difference reduced substantially it still remained that there was about a 10% difference in the risk of an early heart attack between men and women. But a lot of it was explained by the fact that men had more risk factors at a younger age compared to women. So this is an example of how we could ask the question of what protects women from heart disease for that 10 years between age 50 and 60, and from the perspective of ethnic variations, we perform the same analysis to ask the question, do South Asians suffer heart disease earlier than non-South Asians? And of course, we do observe that South Asians were more likely to have a heart attack before the age of 40 years compared to non-South Asians. And my colleague, Dr. Joshi, uh, then adjusted for all the nine risk factors, and this difference went away. So for both men and for people of South Asian origin, the reason why they appear to develop heart disease at earlier stages than women and non-South Asians are due to the fact that they have risk factors earlier on in life. So this made many researchers in the field 
then shift the focus from just studying heart disease in adults to now trying to understand the determinants of risk factors at earlier stages and ages. And my focus shifted from studying South Asians as adults to pregnant South Asian women and their offspring. And what was commonly observed in the South Asian population was individuals start off life as relatively thin, shown here in the cartoon as a stick man or stick woman, and then over the course of the life uh, course, developing abdominal obesity and ending up with this lemon on the toothpick type of look. So we see this time and time again, and my question was, why does this occur? And to address that question, we were funded by the CIHR and the Heart and Stroke Foundation, along with the Indian Council of Medical Research, to create a South Asian birth cohort study, which means recruiting pregnant South Asian women and their offspring and following them forward in time to try and understand the determinants of these cardiometabolic risk factors. And you can see here, uh, we recruited women from rural India in the villages outside of Bangalore in South India, from urban India within Bangalore and within urban Canada, which uh, includes the Peel region, just part of the GTHA. There are a large number of South Asian individuals within the Peel region. And if many of you are not aware, South Asians represent the fastest growing non-white ethnic group in Canada. So this question is important. What causes early heart attacks? Why do South Asians have early onset diabetes? And we searched within the pregnant women and their offspring for some of these answers. And we first compared the South Asian after recruiting a thousand South Asian moms and their babies from the Peel region, we looked at the differences in a number of risk factors as compared to white Caucasian pregnant women and their offspring. And the first thing we observed is the pre-pregnancy body mass index is lower in the South Asian women. That means they're smaller statured and lower weight. We also observed that South Asian women were more likely to have gestational diabetes in spite of being smaller statured compared to the white Caucasians. Then when we look at the birth weight of their babies, they correlate with the pre-pregnancy weight of the mother. So lower in the South Asian babies, higher in the white Caucasian babies. And then when we measure body fat by the skin fold thickness uh, of the newborn babies, Interestingly, and rather unexpectedly, we see that the South Asian babies, despite being lower birth weight, have more body fat. So this is something called the thin fat phenotype that has been observed in South Asian adults, but is present at birth amongst newborns, which almost sets up an individual to be at higher risk for developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. We then compared the South Asians of Canada to the South Asians within India. And this is important because the relative norms that we use to define body mass index or uh, diabetes, diabetes diagnoses are usually based on white Caucasian cutoffs. Probably the real normal distribution of these risk factors are best uh, determined from the population uh, based on the same ethnic origin. So here, when we look across the South Asian free birth cohorts going from rural to urban Canada, we can see the most striking difference is the change in the body mass index. And each point on the body mass index scale reflects about six pounds in body weight. So we're seeing a very large difference in body weight between the rural South Asians and the South Asians here in Canada. And correlated with that is an increase in gestational diabetes. So 25% of our South Asian moms in the Peel region here in Ontario suffer gestational diabetes 
And we know that that puts the mother at risk for future cardiovascular disease and also programs her newborn to have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. And so although we observed the birth weight was lower uh, compared to white Caucasians, uh, within the South Asian only comparison, it correlates with the mother's pre-pregnancy BMI and gestational diabetes status. So what we're observing in the South Asian population is that risk factors for cardiovascular disease are present at birth. They're likely uh, influenced strongly by the mother. And in fact, this sets up what we call the transgenerational cycle of diabetes transmission, where there's both a genetic component as well as uh, possibly lifestyle features that bring out this insulin resistance in early onset type 2 diabetes. And if you look across Canada at the children with obesity who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, so children with type 2 diabetes, which is not what we usually expect, they are more likely to be South Asian origin or Indigenous origin compared to uh, white Caucasians. So it's a very important and growing problem that we need to address within Canada. When I present this work, many people say, well, it must be genetic. It must be that genetic variants explain why South Asians develop high rates of type 2 diabetes. So we now are able to look at genetic variants as related to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and many of these risk factors. And I'll show you here that in the early days of this research, the understanding was South Asians will have different genetic variants compared to white Caucasians, that they would be completely different. We now know that we have common uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic variants that are related to diseases. The frequency of these variants may differ, just like the cardiovascular risk factor frequency varies, but the association is likely similar. Now, how good is genetics at classifying people based on their ancestry or ethnic group? And what we see is when we ask individuals to self-report their ethnicity, and we also look at their genome-wide uh, genetic variant frequency, that these two features correlate tightly. So if I report I'm of South Asian origin and I also have my genome assessed through genotyping, uh, this will likely correlate tightly, as we can see in the circle here around India. So that is reassuring that in our large studies, we can ask people for their self-reported ethnicity. I will say that within each one of these clusters, if we then did another principal components analysis, we would see that there is variation within an ethnic group where the North Indians may separate from the South Indians. So broadly speaking, ethnicity correlates with the genetic profile we observe. Now, one of my former master's students, now a, a cardiologist at McMaster, used the interheart study data created a gene score and assessed this gene score across different ethnic groups, looking for an association with heart attack or myocardial infarction. And here we show that, in fact, the odds ratio of this gene score to predict myocardial infarction is very consistent across ethnic groups. We do get wider confidence intervals because of variations in sample sizes, but in general, the effect size of the gene score on myocardial infarction is similar. My former PhD student, Sara Sohani, who then came to U of T for uh, medical school, did a similar analysis looking at genetic variants associated with type 2 diabetes in South Asians and Europeans. You'll see in the center of the Venn diagram there are common genetic variants found in both ethnic groups to be associated with type 2 diabetes. And here on the left side of the slide, you'll see their effect size or odds ratio is very consistent. However, I draw your attention to the green aspects of the Venn diagram that suggests there are separate genetic variants that also may be associated with type 2 diabetes in South Asians 
and separate genetic variants in white Caucasians. So this is intriguing. The only way we'll know if South Asians and white Caucasians have unique genetic variants is to do well-powered large-scale studies. In the white Caucasians, those have been completed. In the South Asians, however, we still have work to do. And I show you next the worldwide distribution of type 2 diabetes. We're now at about 600 million cases worldwide. And the prediction is in the next 20 years, we could get to 1 billion cases. So I think that we have a global epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And if you look at the countries of the world where they have the highest rates shown in orange and red, I'll draw your attention to India in the Middle East. So we know that type 2 diabetes is a big problem in these countries. In India alone, the prediction is we're at 80 million cases of type 2 diabetes at the present. That's double the entire Canadian population. So it's at epidemic proportions now. If we then look at the proportion of individuals who have had uh, genetic studies carried out to help us understand causes of type 2 diabetes, there's a very di interesting difference in the pie chart. You'll see that uh, individuals in the gray zone represent individuals who have been uh, included in, uh, in studies of type 2 diabetes, and individuals in panel B who have been included in genetic studies. So South Asians shown in gray have a huge burden of type two diabetes, but have been relatively understudied from a genetics perspective. And so we use these ratios called uh, participation to prevalence ratio. And we aim to be at about one. So if you're included in studies uh, and this reflects the burden of disease in the population, we should achieve unity. And what you see in this diagram is individuals of white Caucasian origin have a participation to prevalence ratio of over four, whereas people of South Asian origins participation to prevalence ratio is around 0 0.2, 0 0.25. And so this tells us that white Caucasians are overstudied from a genetics point of view as related to type two diabetes, and South Asians are understudied. And we can ask, why is this? And it's multiple factors, no doubt, right from policymakers to those who de decide on the funding to those researchers who are interested in specific questions. So I think these types of metrics are really important for us across a number of disease conditions to make sure we're doing the research needed by the population. We need to reflect the diseases that affect certain ethnic groups and certain populations, as opposed to continuing to do more and more work in a population who is not as at risk. So as a clinician, where I see patients with cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, I will ask about the patient sitting in front of me, what makes this patient sick? As an epidemiologist, thinking about population health, however, I will stand back and say, what makes this population sick? So there are two contrasting approaches, but having them both informs each other. So from that perspective, I'll back out from the human genome to then talk about the social determinants of health. And some of you may have seen Sander Galeo's uh, article where he promotes the idea that zip code in the United States is more informative in terms of health outcomes than genetic code. And it's a nice way of reminding us the powerful uh, social determinants of health that have a huge impact on people's uh, development of cardiovascular disease, but other chronic diseases like cancer. So what are these? Poverty, social isolation, uh, limited educational attainment are amongst the strongest determinants of health. And this cumulative disadvantage, similar to what I showed with the weathering hypothesis, takes a greater toll in certain groups. And we can only think now of the COVID population and the distribution 
of uh, COVID in different populations uh, to again bring this front of mind. Now I mentioned sex and gender, I mentioned ethnicity, race, and now we're talking about social determinants of health. It's really important in any research analysis or when we think about an analysis of a population health problem to consider how these factors intersect. So this gets to the notion of intersectionality. If we look at a problem only from a sex and gender perspective, we may ignore or miss the importance of their ethnicity or their socioeconomic status. And when we look at this uh, from an intersectionality perspective, we see the worst health outcomes in chronic diseases are experienced by poor women of color. And that speaks to the importance of examining our problems with this broad lens. In a study that uh, we conducted a number of years ago, along with my colleague Fahad Razak, who's now at University of Toronto, we looked at the impact of social disadvantage on uh, cardiovascular disease. We put together a score that included employment status, income status, and whether or not individuals had social support through being married. And you can see as we move from European origin to South Asian to Chinese to indigenous people, the social disadvantage that they experienced increased. When we correlate the social disadvantage with cardiovascular disease, you can see that individuals of South Asian and indigenous origin had higher scores and therefore higher cardiovascular disease. And in fact, it's interesting to note that women who typically are thought of as having lower rates of cardiovascular disease than men from indigenous and South Asian populations had higher cardiovascular prevalence compared to men of the white Caucasian groups. So again, making the point that we have to consider all of these factors when we look at the determinants and distribution of disease. My colleague Salim Youssef's large international cohort study called PURE, uh, in which he looked at many of the inter-heart risk factors as determinants of cardiovascular disease and total mortality, recently published this analysis in The Lancet that showed, if you look on your far left, that individuals with low education uh, have a large burden of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, low education was the strongest risk factor of cardiovascular mortality and total mortality compared to our usual consideration of diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. So that speaks to, again, the powerful effect of education in maintaining good health. And I learned this lesson when I was analyzing the work I did with the Six Nations community uh, looking at the impact of social factors on cardiovascular health. Every time I put all of my usual cardiovascular risk factors into the model, income came up as being the strongest factor. And although individuals with low income have more cardiovascular risk factors, even after adjusting for the differences in cardiovascular risk factors, income remained an important predictor of cardiovascular disease. So we can't forget that. Now, if we move from the Six Nations community to a more recent study that I led in partnership with eight First Nations communities across the country that span from the West Coast, including the Gitsan, to the East Coast, including the Mi'kmaq people, we looked at between these eight communities, the burden of cardiovascular risk factors using the inter-heart risk score. We show that 85% of people in our study of 1300 had high or moderate levels of cardiovascular risk factors. Instead of asking the question and making the comparison of indigenous to non-indigenous populations, we asked the question, what may protect some individuals and communities from a high burden of risk factors, whereas what may put others at risk. And we recently published this in the end of 2019, showing that there are certain factors, including social disadvantage, the same factors I described earlier, 
low access to primary care, being on a prescription medication, and the cost of the medication being associated with a higher cardiovascular risk factor burden, whereas the protective factors were those individuals who had completed high school or beyond, those individuals who had a lot of family and friend support, and those individuals who lived in communities where there was high trust between neighbors. These were protective factors. So if we put all of these factors together and say, what results in an individual today in a First Nations community with cardiovascular disease, it's not just, are they taking medications we prescribe? It's more than that. It is why do they have a higher burden of cardiovascular risk factors and what are those broad determinants? They can start very broadly at why do people live in reserve com communities? That goes right back to issues of colonization, ongoing systemic racism, and then the setup of the reserves today in terms of how people can access health care. And then the protective factors will be how have families adapted and live together? How have communities been able to ensure their kids can graduate from high school on the protective side of the spectrum? So these are the broad ways we look at health outcomes. And my last points are going to be around access to health care. And this is a type of health equity that is really important for vulnerable populations. So my colleague, Kamara Phyllis-Jones, has created this cliff analogy where you see two populations. One population is set off back from the cliff. The other population is standing right at the cliff edge. And we have to ask ourselves, why are there these variations in populations where some people are just about to fall over a cliff whereas others are protected. That is a difference in social determinants of health and preventive health care. We also then have the fence. The fence prevents individuals from falling over the cliff. Why do only some groups have a fence there for them, whereas others do not? And finally, if an individual falls over the cliff, an ambulance is only there to take some people to the hospital and is broken or has a flat tire for the other people. So we have to ask the questions, why in a country like Canada do we still have differences in health equity? These are important future questions. And as I conclude, you will see from my own research program that it's important for us to consider ancestral origin, sex and gender, and social factors as related to chronic diseases. It helps us understand the causes of the causes, so the causes of risk factors, causes of health care disparities and access disparities, why some people adhere to medical therapy and others do not, why some people trust or don't trust their doctors and research, and as a society, where is it best for us and highest yield for us to spend our health care and social dollars. So in summary, there are global shifts in the way of living that have changed the risk factor profile for chronic diseases globally. In Canada, as a high income country with a public health care system, our focus should be on high risk populations and high risk communities. By engaging high risk and diverse populations, we can efficiently understand not only disease etiology, as I've shown you with some genetic studies, but we can assist in the future design of health interventions designed to improve health outcomes. In order to meet this challenge, we need good people to tackle difficult problems. So thank you very much again for having me, and I'll stop there, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Nan, so much for your important and pivotal work and sharing your research insights with us today. Uh, we are going to reserve questions for the end, but just want to quickly say this is an amazing body of work. And also, thank you for sharing your personal stories. It's always inspirational to see how you had this happen in your life and you want to set out and make a difference to better understand it and improve our healthcare. And as you said at the end, I want to thank you for being a great person doing great work. Um, so now we're going to transition over to Dr. Jillian Hawker. Uh, Dr. Jillian Hawker 
is the Sir John and Lady Eaton Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a Senior Scientist at the Women's College Research Institute. She is a rheumatologist and health services, health services researcher whose research has focused on advancing care of people with osteoarthritis. She has published over 300 peer-reviewed articles and in 2020 was the recipient of the OARSI Award for Clinical Research. Today, she'll be speaking on the impact of population studies on, on individual care with regards to osteoarthritis and how such studies are critical to improving the understanding of personal risk, identifying mechanisms of disease, and directing potential targets for behavior and medical intervention. Thank you, Dr. Hawker, and I'll pass it over now to you. Thanks very much. And it's really hard to follow Sonia, who did such an amazing job. Um, I'm going to try to share. I just lost my share. Hang on. Here we go. Did somebody give? Thank you. And uh, da, 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 da. I'm hoping that you're seeing that. Are you? Yes. Now? Okay. So I only have a few minutes um, and there's so much that Sonia brought up that, you know, we could talk about, but what I specifically was asked to talk about is why it's important to do population based studies and how they contribute to individual care. So I, I am going to use my own research experience uh, to provide that example. I think Dr. Nand has already done that beautifully, but I'm going to, I'm going to touch on a few additional points. So first off, population-based studies, as she's shown, are absolutely critical to scientific discovery. Um, they are critically important, again, as she's uh, exemplified in her research, to generate testable hypotheses. We need those hypotheses to inform public health interactions, such as the first observation between smoking and lung cancer, drug development, if we understand relationships between a genetic background or a mechanism, we can then target therapies and, and develop new therapies. Healthcare delivery in terms of, as uh, Dr. Anand has shown, disparities in access to care, uh, different uh, reasons why people may be less likely to uh, receive care. And finally, clinical management. Importantly, observational studies, as she's shown, are important in helping us with prognosticating. So identifying people at risk, I, uh, quantifying the risk, understanding what might be the most effective treatment, and also um, helping with diagnosis. So I'm gonna talk about osteoarthritis and I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. Um, this is my focus area of research. It is by far the most common cause of arthritis affecting uh, one in three people uh, 65 and over. But it's common risk factors include aging, obesity and physical in inactivity. And so the burden of osteoarthritis is growing dramatically, especially with the knee because the knee is most strongly related to obesity. Knee osteoarthritis is most likely to cause disability in the population, and we're seeing a lot of people, including young people now, presenting with advanced arthritis in their knees, as well as other joints. The symptoms of osteoarthritis cause a huge economic burden in our population that we cannot continue to ignore, which we are. So way back even more than 20 years ago, um, I was fortunate enough to get funding to uh, begin a large cohort study in Ontario. We recruited 100% of the population 55 and over in two regions of Ontario, a rural region and an urban region. Um, and I won't go into the reasons why we chose those regions. But suffice it to say, this uh, was a baseline questionnaire and then follow-up questionnaires that explored the prevalence and impact of symptomatic hip and knee osteoarthritis. I was particularly interested in access to joint replacement at the time and still am. And uh, also examined quality of care, both fault barriers and facilities, uh, facilitators of care for people with OA. 
we're very fortunate in Canada and particularly in Ontario to be able to take our cohort data and link them with health administrative databases, which is what I was able to do at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, um, which now has multiple pods around the province. And that made it possible to link information about people that they told us to their healthcare utilization, uh, their associated costs of care, their hospitalizations, and ultimately um, bad outcomes from whatever conditions they were dealing with, including mortality. So in uh, one slide, we surveyed almost 40,000 people back in the mid 1990s. Of those 30,000 responded. We had some people that were ineligible for the study for a variety of reasons, but had a cohort of 20,000 people that we then identified uh, further in terms of their burden of arthritis and followed them forward for over 15 years. Of those 20,000 uh, individuals at baseline, 10% had hip OA based on self-report criteria, 15% had knee OA, and 25% uh, had difficulty walking. I'm summarizing a lot of research, but basically we found that the quality of, of osteoarthritis diagnosis and treatment was poor. And it was particularly poor in the setting of other common chronic conditions. And in fact, we know now that people with osteoarthritis, because of that common risk factors, obesity and aging, are very, very likely to be living with other chronic conditions. So we've learned that 60 to 90 percent of people with symptomatic knee osteoarthritis have at least one or more chronic conditions. And again, because common things are common and obesity is a common risk factor, the most common other conditions that they're living with are diabetes, high blood pressure and heart disease. We've also learned through studying these people and talking to them and doing qualitative research in the cohort that when nobody offers somebody a treatment for their painful joint, their general approach is to give up activities that make things hurt and they become increasingly sedentary and they become, many of them, couch potatoes because nobody's bothered to take care of their OA. So we asked the question, and this was doctoral uh, work done by two doctoral students of mine, Lauren King and Tatiana Kenzerska, to look at the likelihood of self-reported difficulty walking, a simple yes, no, uh, related to the number of hips or knees that met our criteria for symptomatic OA. She looked at, they looked at many, many other conditions um, that may impact difficulty walking. We did look at the social health determinants as well uh, because they are incredibly important. But what we found was that the likelihood of a person reporting difficulty walking was most strongly related to whether or not they had OA. And in particular, there was this very striking dose effect between the number of joints affected with painful osteoarthritis, um, which you can see here. So that set up, again, as Dr. Anand um, pointed out, a whole series of questions that we were interested in, um, in asking and hypotheses that we wanted to test. In particular, we hypothesized that people with hip and knee OA would have difficulty walking or mobilizing, they wouldn't receive treatment, so they become increasingly physically inactive. And that would put them at risk of weight gain, hypertension, and potentially developing cardiometabolic diseases like diabetes and, and heart attacks and stroke. So we looked at our cohort first who uh, had hip and knee OA, and we looked at their baseline level of difficulty walking on a four point scale, so higher, worse. And we looked at time to a cardiovascular event over follow up using the health utilization data, the health administrative databases. And what we found is after controlling for the risk factors, this was unplanned, but that uh, Dr. Nan talked about, in the bottom in red there, we saw again a very clear dose effect between the baseline difficulty walking and the likelihood of going on to die of any cause and also uh, experience a cardiovascular event. So if you had no difficulty walking, uh, if you had a, diff a mild difficulty walking, you had a 30% increased risk of all-cause death over a period of about 12 years. If you had two hips or knees, it went up close to 70%. And if you had three hips or knees, it was 120% higher than having no joints. 
We also looked at diabetes incidence, we looked at diabetes complications and continued to find this relationship. So what we learned from a series of studies that are observational is that in people with diabetes or heart disease, having concomitant OA related difficulty walking, which is probably a, a proxy for physical inactivity, still to be tested, may be a modifiable risk factor for adverse events for those other conditions. And what's important to do for us is now translate that. So we've just received funding in the last year from CIHR to test that hypothesis. So we're looking at people who are receiving care for diabetes, and we're going to ask the question, is improved diagnosis and treatment of OA in those people associated with improved ability to walk and therefore engage in physical activity? And will that up ultimately improve their glucose control? So this is work ongoing. It would not have happened without observational work. We're working with primary care and the Diabetes Action Canada folks because ultimately this is a growing population with multiple conditions and we need to get out of our silos and start thinking about the combinations of conditions. And again, as Sonia already mentioned, it may look different within women, men, different background, ethnicities, origins, and we will be looking at that. And I'll leave it there. So observational studies are key. They're generally the first step prior to design and, and implementation of a randomized trial. And they're critically important in improving evaluation of personal risk, identifying mechanisms of disease, which I hope I've shown you, and so has Dr. Anand, and directing potential targets for behavior and medical interventions. Thanks very much. That was fantastic. Thank you for your time and your scientific insights, uh, Dr. Hawker. Uh, our next panelist today is Dr. Sheldon Tobe. Dr. Sheldon Tobe is a professor in medicine at the University of Toronto, where he is a staff physician in the Division of Nephrology and a professor of medicine at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, where he was the inaugural Heart and Stroke Foundation Chair in Aboriginal and Rural Health Research. Dr. Tobe is a hypertension specialist and nephrologist with a research background in clinical outcome studies where he focuses on the implementation and dissemination of clinical practice guidelines to assist healthcare providers achieve and maintain best practices. Today, he will be speaking on the defeat of end-stage diabetic kidney disease in Indigenous communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Tobin. and I'll pass it over to you now. Oh, that's great. Thanks so much. And it's my pleasure to participate in this year's Massey Grand Round Symposium, featuring Dr. Sonia Nand as the 2020 Janet Rossant Lecturer. These are my objectives. A little bit about myself. In the late 1990s, at the same time I started work with clinical practice guideline development, I was invited by the Battleford Tribal Council in Saskatchewan to help with research to demonstrate that blood pressure control in people with diabetes was possible and could reduce progression to end-stage renal disease and the need for dialysis. This was the start of the dream studies that have just completed. The DREAM research studies have all been initiated by and in partnership with the Indigenous communities that have participated in them. I and my research colleagues have adhered to these important principles, including good clinical practice, OCAP, and community-based participatory research. This data comes from the United States Renal Data Service and shows new start dialysis patients by the cause of kidney disease. Diabetes is the leading cause. These charts show that the increasing need for dialysis, which is what communities like the Battlefords were experiencing in the late 1990s and early 2000s. The x-axis shows the years from 1980 to 2008. The y-axis, the rate per million population. There's a very rapid rise in the rate of new onset of dialysis after 1980, and then a flattening of the curve after the year 2000. The reason for the flattening of the curve was implementation of research studies of blood pressure control and treatment with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, resulting in a slowing of progression to end-stage renal disease and the need for dialysis. Canada was following a similar progression. In 2001, with the new research information, we developed clinical practice guidelines for people with diabetes and hypertension and disseminated the information to Canadian healthcare providers. The new standard of care for people with type 2 diabetes became 
control of blood pressure to less than 130 over 80, control of blood glucose with an A1C target of 7% or lower, healthy diet, enough exercise, smoking cessation, and treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARBs. We were able in indigenous and non-indigenous populations with diabetes to increase blood pressure control to over 50% and use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs to around 60%. This data comes from the CAIHI, Canadian Institute for Health Information, and it's dated from 2013. The dark blue line is indigenous Canadians and the light blue line, the rest of the country. You can see that there's much higher incidence of dialysis in the in indigenous populations. During this time, from 2004 to 2008, despite this uh, ongoing efforts to find new combinations of therapies and treatments, the curve remained flat, but did not improve. And a lot of research was ongoing at that time. Then in 2018, a breakthrough, when the Credence study was stopped early for efficacy and presented in early 2019. The Credence study assessed the effectiveness of the new diabetes medication class SGLT2 inhibitors in a multinational study for people with advanced kidney disease from diabetes. All of the study participants were already treated with ACE inhibitors or ARBs and had reasonable blood pressure control. The study drug in Vocana, canagliflozin, slowed kidney disease progression by 30% compared to placebo. This was an even greater response than previously found from blood pressure lowering or ACE inhibitors or ARBs alone. After so many years of negative results in patients with diabetes and advanced nephropathy, this study showed a dramatic improvement in outcome. Note that this improvement is over and above the effect of RAS blockade and blood pressure control. How is this new information going to impact on someone who is about to get kidney disease today and is at risk for, uh, who's about to get diabetes today and is at risk for uh, developing kidney disease? Let's apply everything we know to a 40 year old who's at risk for diabetes, just about to go off that cliff that uh, Dr. Anand showed us. And uh, notice that there's no watch here. Today's management uh, on the left and tomorrow's on the right with the impact of our best management. Diet and exercise prevent the new onset of diabetes by 10 years, so age 50. Dr. Hawker's program to uh, improve OA keeps people moving and now diabetes is delayed. Now, instead of developing microalbuminuria in five years, it's 10 years or age 60. And by the time severe nephropathy occurs, macroalbuminuria, our person will be 75 years old instead of 55. Kidney function within Volcana will last longer, falling 1.85 mils per minute per year, so that at age 60, their GFR is 60 mils per minute, let's say, it will take 27 more years to fall below 10 mils per minute and then need to start dialysis. That patient will be over 100 years old by then. Contrast that with today's patient that will end up on dialysis by age 65, by 65 or 66. I've not mentioned the additional cardiovascular benefits that these patients will experience. This year, we will have updated diabetes guidelines with a strong recommendation for the role of SGLT2 inhibitors to prevent the need for dialysis. My research is now focused on how to bring this information to the populations and people who need it. Diabetes causes a great imbalance in human physiology, causing end organ damage with heart disease, eye disease, and a loss of kidney function and need for dialysis. Research studies like the DREAM studies, the Credence study, and the research efforts of Dr. Anand have helped us restore the balance and the determinants of health that cause disease progression. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tobe, for your fantastic presentation. Um, I will now pass it over to Dr. Angel to facilitate a roundtable discussion with all the panelists. Well, thank you very much, colleague. It's now an opportunity for uh, our speakers to ask questions of each other. Uh, cross talk if you like. We can already pose questions for you to address. You've each heard each other's presentations. 
let's open the floor and invite questions from each of you. Thank you so much for your uh, provocative comments and new signs. It's been very exciting to see what interventions are now flowing related to disease progression in society. So let's open the floor. Who would like to pose a question to the call? Well, if I can jump in, I, I, a question for both Drs. Hawker and Dr. Nen. I mean, in my clinical practice, I've been practicing long enough now that so many of my patients, um, as they get older, they develop osteoarthritis. Uh, as Dr. Hawker points out, they, their knee starts to go, their uh, activity level falls, and they, they seem to fall off that cliff and end up, um, their blood sugar rises and, and all of the other factors go out of control. They develop diabetes. And then if uh, they, they have low socioeconomic status, um, low education, um, they, they seem to get into a lot more trouble. And um, I find it as a clinician, many times I have trouble communicating with patients who seem to have a lack of trust. And Sonia, I'm wondering if, you're, you, if you've picked up these issues of trust uh, um, and, and how, how you feel that, that trust is linked to the social determinants of health and how clinicians can, uh, can address that. Yeah, thank you for the question, Sheldon. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a real issue and it's really important. It's almost like as clinicians, we have to imagine the life that our patients had to live to then end up in front of us. And as I showed in the weathering hypothesis slide, it's likely some experiences we can't even imagine they've gone through. And with respect to trust, Trust has been shown in many studies to be a key component of the therapeutic relationship that is related to people um, taking the drugs that you recommend they take. Um, you'll know that from hypertension that only 25% of people who leave your office with a prescription will actually be taking it regularly. And so uh, trust has to take time and it has to be developed. So again, we almost need to flip our current practice models on their heads and devote more time to our therapeutic relationships with our patients from vulnerable populations. And that gets challenging because we see new patients for an hour, we see follow-ups for half an hour, and we're super busy seeing and doing all kinds of other things that taking that time sometimes we, we don't do. So from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, that's important. With indigenous populations, uh, cultural tr uh, safety training is really important to help us understand their worldview and perspective. And we also have to try and right the wrongs of the past. So people who've had a bad interaction with the healthcare system, be it in the emergency room or in another situation, obviously will have almost like a, a PTSD or post-traumatic um, sense to that uh, encounter. So again, we need to spend the extra time. We have to learn about where they've come from and then build that therapeutic relationship over time. Just takes time. I think the additional thing is communication is essential. So there's so many patients I hear say, the doctor didn't spend much time with me. I'm not really sure what they say. So from a clinician's perspective, that time and communication is crucial. Can I add a couple of things I, that I think are complementary to that? Um, what in my arthroplasty joint replacement area variation work, you know, huge variations by education, income, gender, um, socioeconomic status, obviously, um, in who gets an art, uh, a joint replacement. And in fact, some of the reasons were real. So for instance, somebody with lower socioeconomic status in the US in particular is much more comfortable in a small community hospital than a big intimidating academic health sciences center. And in fact, there's a strong relationship between the volume of procedures a surgeon performs or the hospital performs and the, the, the goodness of the outcomes. So if a certain population is tending to go to the small community hospital that doesn't do a lot of the surgery, whereas the weller off, the better off people are going to the academic center, they are having different outcomes. And I guess the other thing that we've learned is um, 
beliefs, um, health beliefs, but beyond that, beliefs are important. We, we hadn't thought about the role of spirituality and religion as a barrier to arthroplasty. But if you believe you can't go to heaven unless you're whole, you don't want your knee taken out and replaced. And so just understanding the thinking behind um, uh, why people are resistant to a particular treatment action. And just in our research right now around joint replacement, knees, difficulty bending and kneeling has come out as a huge predictor of bad or less good outcome. And people say, oh, well, you don't need to kneel anyhow. Well, if you're, if you're a Catholic, if you're Muslim, if you're from any um, population where kneeling is essential to your cultural practices, you can't say that that's not important. And we weren't even paying attention to that. So I think we have to delve deeper and it does take time as Sonia pointed out. There is a question in the... Yes, there's a question in the pen on the right. This is directed to Dr. Anand. Uh, what has your research shown with respect to um, epigenetic factors in the high-risk South Asian children? Great. That's a really good question. And as many of you know, and especially the person who asked it, uh, epigenetics refers to how the DNA may be differentially methylated that then impacts which genes are expressed, so gene expression. And there have been a number of demonstrations of epigenetic marks that occur based on parents' uh, lifestyles. So for example, a pregnant woman who smokes cigarettes, will um, we see evidence in the offspring's DNA of that smoking exposure that then can express genes differentially. With respect to South Asians, the data is just starting. So data from the UK has demonstrated that that thin fat phenotype I described in South Asian children persists beyond two generations. So it's not as though the first generation South Asian children born in the UK are thin fat and then their kids uh, do not show that phenotype. That phenotype persists. We're trying to do methylation studies on a genome-wide level to show an impact of gestational diabetes on the uh, growing offspring's methylome. But those uh, studies are early and they're challenging because again, many of our normals have been derived from white Caucasian studies, which are, um, you know, growing in number, but they're very few in South Asian populations. So I would just answer by saying, I believe there is an epigenetic factor or factors that differentially uh, result in genes being expressed as related to diabetes, but we're still quite early on in that research. I have another question for you, uh, Sonia. With respect to your GWA uh, study, do you have any uh, insight in the relationship between the genetic variants with respect to any gene products or metabolic pathways that uh, are identifiable and that relate to those risk uh, uh, gene studies? Right, that's a, another excellent question. And there have been some recent studies in South Asians us using not just GWAS, but whole genome sequencing where um, pathways have been identified. So John Chambers and colleagues have published this. And it's interesting, there appears to be um, certain pathways um, identified in the immune signaling, as well as some of the metabolic pathways associated with glucose um, metabolism and lipid metabolism that have emerged. So it's not only related to glucose and lipids, it appears as though there may be uh, some sort of immune signaling component to the pathway. So it's early on again, uh, but certainly an intriguing data. Thank you, and a question for Jillian. Jillian, in your uh, analysis of comorbidities in the OA population, 
is the association um, a sharing association or are there causal relationships between OA and diabetes that are understood metabolically? Yeah, the relationship between OA and diabetes is a, is a really important question and people have been arguing about that for about a decade now. I, it, it, I think the bottom line right now is they are highly associated. There were early studies that said, there were early hypotheses that cardiovascular or not, vascular changes um, would affect the blood flow to the joint and maybe have a causal relationship. Also that metabolic syndrome and adipokines, which actually impact every tissue in the joint, might be playing an independent role. But right now, based on the be best literature and studies that we've got, it looks like it's just common risk factors. So if you adequately control for the risk factors that Sonia showed us, physical activity, cholesterol level, et cetera, there isn't an increased relationship. And what's driving, I think, the, the now acknowledgement of this is that obesity is occurring so much younger that now we're seeing people with OA in much younger ages. And you know, the rapid, most rapidly rising group getting joint replacement is actually under the age of 60 right now. So mm -hmm. I, it seems to be common risk factors, but we know, for instance, obesity is associated with hand OA and we don't walk on our hands. It's not a biomechanical effect. So still much more to understand. Now, uh, we've got a running society. Uh, you mentioned aging as a risk factor. To what extent is running on asphalt if we see people, particularly young people, doing casually a recreation effect OA into it? That's a, that's a great question too, and a common question. Everybody, everybody gets OA eventually. Um, the, uh, the bottom line is that you're perfectly safe to run, but if you injure yourself, you have to allow yourself time to recover. And what most people who are avid rubber runners do is don't want to wait to recover. Um, and asphalt puts you at much higher risk of actually injuring than on a softer surface. So, you know, really as you get older and your joints are a little less elastic than they used to be, and more importantly, the muscles supporting your joints are a little less elastic than they used to be and strong, we should be moving to softer surfaces, better, better footwear, really strong protective footwear, and even brisk walking, there's no real advantage. I, I won't speak to your cardiovascular outcome, but for your, for your musculoskeletal system, brisk walking is just as good. Excellent. Now, Sheldon, I have a question for you about the SDLT. Uh, is it now first line therapy in diabetes management? We were really promoting that as a, an intervention. And you didn't re uh, do the economics of the impact of the decrease in end stage renal disease associated with this uh, medication, which is really uh, quite spectacular. So the the guidelines are being revised and uh, now, now we're able to use these, these agents as first line therapy uh, if we want. Uh, and we're waiting for uh, cost effectiveness analyses, which I'm, I'm sure will show that they are highly cost effective, but we, we have to wait for that information to see how they fit into uh, our armamentarium. And are, are they gonna displace metformin, for example, as first line therapy, because we have that proven cardiovascular and renal benefit um, where I'm still waiting for the data. Maybe, maybe Sonia has some insights into uh, any, anything new that uh, is about to come out. Well, yes. uh, thank you. I don't have some insights into that, but I do see another question, uh, Dr. Angel, from Dr. Flores in the chat, chat box. Please answer that. Read it, Nancy. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Flores for the question, which is, uh, my research demonstrates that a, a guaranteed annual income will be necessary but not sufficient to improve the health of disadvantaged people in our community. What concurrent interventions or policies would you recommend to our political leaders? So that's a really great question. <laughs> it's a big one. Um, the first thing I would say to Dr. Flores is I agree with you that a universal basic income is really important for those uh, individuals who live in a precarious way. 
and uh, it was uh, started and promoted by uh, Kathleen Wynne's government as a pilot project that included Hamilton in our code red uh, uh, group, but then, uh, it was canceled. However, sorry about that. Uh, however, what we do observe now with the CERB payment is it that has been somewhat like a universal basic income, and I think that that uh, hopefully can be continued by our policymakers and politicians. It's really helpful for for vulnerable families and populations. In terms of concurrent interventions, however, income isn't enough. We would have to hopefully getting people in through our healthcare system in a more efficient way. They're challenging problems, but guaranteed income, guaranteed housing are two pillars of a starting point. And then making the person's trajectory through our healthcare system is another way we can help. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colleen, for your participation, uh, your energy, your enhancement of the Massey Grand Round uh, celebration of uh, uh, the General Assembly lectureship. It's now time to uh, invite our uh, co-chairs of the Massey Grand Rounds to uh, uh, begin uh, their portion of the program. And I'll now pass it over to uh, Trish and Anastasia to uh, take the chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Angel. And thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Anand, Dr. Hawker, and Dr. Tobe for your fascinating talk. Thanks to everyone in this room working behind the scenes. And thank you so much to our participants for their um, thought-provoking questions. We hope that you will take away from the symposium some new perspectives and some food for thought. And uh, just as a recruitment plug, this symposium is an event held by Massey Grand Rounds, which is a forum for discussing topics related to medicine, healthcare, and research and practice. We convene monthly during the year with Dr. Angel, senior fellows, and a distinguished guest who shares insights from both their medical training as well as their research and professional journey. We hope that this creates a space for mentorship and growth. If you're interested in participating, please email us at mgr.dinners at gmail.com or follow up on our website to see how you can get a monthly meeting invitation. So with that. Well, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to again uh, uh, thank all participants. This was fascinating. And I have to say, we've been talking at Massey College about uh, the basic income on several of our dialogues. It was interesting that we ended up at the end uh, referring to this. I want to thank uh, Dr. Anand for uh, uh, what a life uh, inspiration uh, of all the, the research that you've done and were so able to communicate. Thank you to, to also uh, to Dr. Hawker and to uh, Dr. Toby for being here today, uh, commenting and exploring new ideas. It was fascinating. Even for a lawyer, I have to say, and for a runner, I thought it was quite interesting to, uh, to reflect on my own behavior. So uh, I just, and also want to thank uh, the Massey Grand Rounds. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Angel for his leadership on, the, on this issue, our, our uh, co-chairs that who are here, and the team at Massey, uh, to put out these uh, these uh, shows demands a lot of uh, planification and a lot a lot of uh, help. So uh, thank you to Matt Blanfield's team and Abra Rissi and to all of you for having been part of this. We're continuing to think and we dare to be wise. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Congratulations again. Thank you very much. Grateful.